Variables in Power Automate for Desktop is a very easy concept. Let me show you how to grasp it. If you have any questions during the video, just post them below and I'll get back to you. I'm Anders Jensen. Let's learn some Microsoft Power Automate for Desktop. Variables in Power Automate Desktop is a very important concept. It allows us to create dynamic flows instead of static and let me show you what that means. But first, let's look at the case. So the case is that a London-based fruit shop, Fresh Fruit Limited, needs our help for their fruit sales. And we are in charge. We will learn about the most common variable type that is text, number and list. We will take a look at the flow variables and the input out variables. And we will introduce some basic Power Automate desktop activities. Let's start. So I go back to Power Automate Desktop. So we create a new flow by clicking here. I will call this fruit and variables like this. Then I click create. Our dashboard will get ready in a few seconds. Here we go. So let me maximize this. And here it is. So we have our actions over here. We have the main where our coding block goes. That's where we drag in actions. And over here we have the variables section. First, let's search for a display message here and drag it in. What this does, it displays a message on your screen or the user screen and then it pauses the robot. Let me show you. So the title could be sale and then the message box display that could be on sale this week, Apple. Then we'll click save and rerun the flow. There you go, on sale this week, Apple. You can see that our robot still runs and it will do so until we click OK here. That's it. This is a very boring solution. This is, this is what we call a static solution. We can't really do much, but let's introduce a variable so we can change this Apple dynamically. We'll do so by searching for a set variable. You can also find it by going into the variables section here and simply just drag it in. We will place it in front of the display message and here we will initialize the variable. It is called new var per default, but if we click here, we can change it. I will change it to fruit because that is a good description of the variable and we can even give it a value. So let's say banana like this. This is the initial value. Then I click save. Then I can double click on the display message. And here we want to use the variable instead of the apple. So if I delete the apple. And to use a variable, we can refer to it. You remember we call it fruit. It needs to be in percentages sign like this fruit and then a percentage. We could also do something very smart. Let me show you. So if I delete here and then I click this X, we can choose it here. Simply just double click on it, it gets automatically written. This is the best approach to do to open it here instead of writing it because then we'll make sure that we don't misspell anything. Then I click save. So now we have a variable and we gave that variable a value that was banana. And now when we're using the variable here, it will output out this value. So let us try that. So I run the flow again. There you go, on sale this week, banana. And similarly, if I double click it again to edit it, change it back to Apple here. So I say save, run the flow again. Now we change it to Apple. Of course, this is also a quite static solution, but now we can change the value of the variable. And this is very useful in our robots. So a very simple example, but this will be very useful later on. Now click OK. So let's try to make it dynamic. We will take on the input of a user and then we will use that input to display a message here. To do so, find a display input dialog here and drag it in. Drag it in in the beginning here. And here we can type something. I will say fruit admin console. Imagine that this could be a window where the agent or the user from the fruit shop could type something in. He or she will type fruits in that will be on sale this week. So I'll call it fruit admin console. 
and I'll say type in the fruit on sale this week, like this. And if we move a little bit down, you can see here that we produce two variables, the user input, which is here, and the button pressed too. The user input, that is what the user will type in in response to this input dialog, and the button press, that is which button the user will press in the input dialog. Let me show you. So if I click save here, and we can delete the set variable, and when we do that, look what's happening. So if I press delete here, you can see that we get our message. That is because we are using the fruit variable down here and we just deleted the initialization of it. To fix that, we'll go to the display input dialog and double click it. And instead of storing the input from the user in the user input, we click down here, double click here, and we will say fruit here. So the input will be stored into the fruit variable. When I click save here, our error disappears. Let me show you what happened. I click run and then I drag in the input dialog. Here we can type in the fruit on sale this week. If I, for example, typed in pear, clicked OK, you can see that we now use the value from the input dialog down here in the display message. Our solution is now dynamic. And then the button pressed variable. Let us try to run it again. Again, I drag it in from my other screen. And here we can see we can press both OK and cancel. And we store that input in a variable. Here I'll just say apple again, press OK, on sale this week, apple. We can see it over here in this flow variables out here in the variables. If you can't find it, it might look like this. You can just click this little X up here. The variables section will come in. And here we can see the values of our variables from the last run. Remember, our the value of our variables will only be there when we run the robot. When the, when the robot stops, they will get reset. But we can see the values from the last run. For example, we can see the fruit that is apple. And if I double click this, we can see that this is a text value. Similarly, we can see our button press 2. This was actually from the display input dialog. And that is called 2 because the button pressed. That was from the display message. We created that one first. We can see that this is okay. If I double click here, we can see that this is also a text variable. So these two are very similar and to differ them, we will rename them. Instead of doing it over here, we can also do it here. Click the three dots here, type in rename. So here I will say button pressed and then I will to differentiate from the display message, I will say input dialog like this. You can see it now, but if you hover your mouse over, you can see it. Similarly, let's change this one. So click the three dots. And here I'll say button press display message like this. Let me show you what happened if I click run. Let me drag in this one here. If I click cancel here, you'll see that this just say on sale this week. This is not really clever because it doesn't make sense. So there's no fruit on sale because the user canceled it. So we want this to not pres be present. So if I click OK here. And what we can do is that we can take advantage of this button pressed input dialog. We can see that this is canceled. So we can look at it and say when this is uh, cancel, then we don't want to do something, or when this is OK, we want to perform this display message action. To do so, let me introduce an if. So I search for an if, and I drag in the if right after the display input dialog. And here I will take a look at the button pressed from the input dialog, and remember we could find it by clicking the X here. Here, I can just double click it, it will be there. So I will say, is this equal to, and now I can check if it's equal to cancel or OK. Since we want to run this action with the OK, I'll pick that, but it will work fine whether we do the OK or the cancel. So I'll say, just say equal to OK like this, and then I click save. So this if is simply just evaluating this condition. It says, is if the button pressed input dialog is equal to OK, then I will perform whatever is in between these two blue ones, that is between the if then and then the end. So if I drag this up here, 
This will only be performed if this button pressed input dialog is, is equal to OK. And now, if we try to, try to run it, I drag in the fruit admin console. So if I say banana, I click OK. On sale this week, banana. And another nice feature is that now we paused it. You can see that this is blue. We are here in our flow. When I click OK, the robot will finish. Let's see if we actually combated the possible error. So if I run it again, I will drag in the fruit console and now I click cancel and then the robot stops because it evaluates here and it says button pressed input dialog is not equal to OK. Then we moved outside just after the end. Nothing more to perform. The robot has stopped. That is very clever. So these flow variables, these are all variables that will get produced inside this flow. We could also have input and output variable. That is, that we can move uh, variables from, for example, a Power Automate Cloud Flow to our Power Automate Desktop Flow. And we can create them up here. So if I just click plus here, I'll say that this is an input. So it comes from another place. We can call this exotic fruit. And let me delete this new input here. It will just come with a string and we can even give it a default value. So this value is that usually it will come in dynamically, but now we will hard code it in. So I'll say pineapple like this. We can also say what name it will have externally and let's just have it the same value as up here like this. So if I click create here, you can see that we now have an input variable. That is a variable that goes into our desktop flow. We gave it the value pineapple. It's as I said, it's unusual that we'll hard code in this variable. And let me show you that we can change it. So if I double click this display message, so instead of fruit, let me delete this, click the X. Now we can choose the exotic fruit. So if I click here, we have the exotic fruit and look what's happening. So if I run it, I drag in this and now I write banana. Okay. And on sale this week, it will be pineapple. That was because we used the exotic fruit with the hard coded value pineapple. Then we'll click OK. Let's change it back to fruit. So I double click it. Then I'll, I can just delete it here. I'll say fruit. We're doing a lot of repetitions in this course and that is necessary when we want to learn things. So I hope you follow along and I definitely hope that you will build the things with me. Now let's look at another common variable type and that is the number. So we set a variable again. So let me go up here. I'll search for a set variable like this and then I drag it in in the end. This one I'll call price. So I click here and just say price. If you saw what I did, I just start typing. I even typed over the percentage signs. But if I click away and I click back, the percentage signs will get added automatically. These percent signs, if you haven't noticed, they will indicate that this is a variable. So let's give it a default value. Let's say that all our fruits will cost 2.6, or at least that will be the price in the beginning. The decimal delimiter will be a dot, even though that in your culture, it might be a comma. In my culture, it's a comma, but remember to use dot. This is 2.6. So then I click save. Now we can alter the display message. So if I double click here, we can say on sale this week, then we can say fruit, then we can say is sold at, and then we can use the price. So if I click the X here again, and we can double click the price here, we could actually see if I open up this variable again, we can see that this price is a numeric value compared to our other text values. Then I just click cancel. I click save and I run it. Dragging in the fruit admin console, I'll say banana again. Then I'll click OK. Here we go. On sale this week, banana is sold at 2.6. I click OK. Our robot ran. We can also see the variable type if we go over here. Try to double click on it. You can see that it says numeric value. So I click close. And again, let's change the set variable to another display input dialog. So if I close this one here and say, input dialog and drag it in. The title will be price and down here in the input dialog message, I will say 
type in the price of the fruit like this. We will store it not in user input, but it's something called price, so it's more descriptive. So if I go down here, double click it, I'll say price, then I'll click save. We now stored it in a price. So we can delete this variable up here, the set variable, we just delete this. It gets initialized in this action. Pay attention to, this is perform sequential, so this one will be performed first, then this one and this one. So we might want to have the fruit before the price. What I can do here, just mark it and drag it up here. They changed place. Let us try to run it. Drag in the fruit admin console, I'll say banana. And I'll say 2.6, like this, okay. Banana is sold at 2.6, so now this worked. Let's work a bit with the number because now we want to round it off. So we take a price here and we don't want the decimals and we can do a truncate action here. So truncate number and we can drag it in. So drag it in after we've taken the price. So now we need a number to truncate and that is our price variable. So if I click here, I'll scroll a little bit down. Now it's disappeared. So if I scroll down, it is here. So I can double click it and we have it. If we get the integer part, that will be the part that is in front of the dot. That will be the whole number. We can also have the decimal part. That is the part that is after the dot. And finally, you can have the round number. Let's have the get integer part first. Now you need to pay close attention. Almost all of our actions here, they produce some sort of variables and this produced a truncated value. So if we just save here, this will get stored into truncated value. And because we don't use this truncated value anywhere else in our flow, nothing will happen. It will be the same. So we either need to change uh, the price in here to the truncated value, or we can just say that we change the price to the integer part and then we'll store it back into price. Let's do so. So if I just click here, click here. Now we will alter the price and do like this. So let me try to run it again. We will have banana again. The price will be 2.6. Here we go, we have rounded it off. But this was an erroneous rounding if we see it in a real life world. It might be useful in some robots, but we want to round it off nicely. So this should be rounded up to three. And what we can do here is that we'll go into truncate number again. Then instead of get integer part, we can say round number. And now we can choose the decimal places. I just want to say zero. I click save. Then I can run it again. I drag it in. I say banana. I click OK. I can say 2.6 again. I click OK. There you go. We round it off nicely. One thing that we could optimize here in our flow, now it gets a bit advanced. I hope you will try to do it here and make it work. It's not that complicated. But it's about expression and Boolean outcomes. Let me show you. So here we checked if the button pressed from this input dialog is equal to OK. And that was actually the fruit input dialog. To not confuse ourselves, let's rename this button pressed input dialog to button press fruit input dialog. So if I go over here, I hover my mouse over, this is it. Click the three dots here, click rename. Now I just add in a fruit here so we can see it. It got changed down here. And similarly, let's change this to button pressed price input dialog. Now it's probably more easy just to open it. Click down here, here, button pressed priced input dialog. What we're doing here is just changing the name of the variables. I'll click save again. So now we can see it over here. Button pressed fruit input dialog, button pressed priced input dialog. But we're only inspecting the button pressed fruit input dialog. If that one is clicked OK, then we perform this. So this means that if we click OK here, cancel here, we will still get in here. We are not interested in that. We will only display message if we get a fruit and a price and the user haven't clicked cancel to either one of them. We can solve that in different ways. The easiest thing is to go into the if, so double click here, and in this expression, we can write in expressions between two, per, between two percentages sign. 
So here I'll say button pressed fruit input dialog, then I'll say space equals to, in single quotation marks, I'll say OK. Then we will use the AND operator, that means that both the expressions that we'll write now will be should be true before we perform the if. So here I'll say, is this equal to OK? AND, and since we are lazy, let me copy this, paste it in here, and change it to button pressed, price input dialog. We also need to ask, is this equal to OK in single quotation marks and a space? The space doesn't do anything more than making this nice to look at. You can delete the spaces, it will not make a difference. Now we will say, this is an expression, so we will say, is this equal to OK and is this equal to OK? Then Power Automate Desktop will evaluate and this can have a true and false outcome. So we want to ask if both of them are OK, then we want uh, the true outcome. So if this is equal to true, and again in percentage sign, this is a Boolean outcome, so I'll say true, and a percent signs more. Then I can click save. Hey, do you want to network and solve problems with more than 2,500 Power Automate and RPA developers? Then join my Discord. It's free and a great investment in your career. See you there, the link is in the description below. Let's try to run it and see if we run into an error. Hint, hint, we do. So if I click run here, so let me drag the fruit admin console. We want to test that if we type in a fruit and then not a price, but if we click cancel, then we shouldn't go into here. But look what's happening. If I say banana, I'll click OK. Then we want the price and here the user clicks cancel and look what's happening. Now we get an error here. This is a good introduction to error handling as well. We can see argument number must be a numeric value. We didn't put anything here into the price, so here it will it will try to do something, but it can't because the argument number that will be a null and it cannot be performed. So what we should do here is that we could take this truncate number and drag it in here as well. So then we only perform it if both of the actions uh, will be clicked OK. This is actually nice as well because this will save performance because all the time the user click cancel here, we will not do the truncate number. I know it's not a lot here now, we have a simple robot, but these kind of performance hacks will do a lot as RPA developers. Now try to run it again. Here I can say banana, I click OK. And let's test it if we click cancel. It worked. Let's see if we try type in numbers in both of them that it actually works as well. So if I click run here, drag this one in, I'll say banana, and the banana cost 3.6 today, then I'll click OK. Here we go, banana is sold at four. Remember we round the number up to zero decimals. This is four, fine. You can now use variables and you can make if conditions. Another common variable type that is the data table. We'll look at that in the Excel session, so leave it for now. And finally, the list. This is very useful too. When you want to store a lot of values of the same type, we use a list. So this list can be iterated. That means that we go through each of the items in that list and perform actions. Let me show you. First, let us just delete everything here. I mark the first one, then click Shift in and click up here, and then I click, click Delete. So we have an empty canvas. This is to make it more simple. So what we'll do here is that we'll create a new list. You can find it in variables or by searching for it. Here I'll say Create New List, drag it in. We will call this Vectables, like this, and then I click Save, like this. Do notice that it gets created out here and our other flow variables, they are now deleted because they are not present in our flow anymore. We still have this exotic fruit, but since we're not using it, best practice is to delete it. So I'll just delete it. Always clean up your variables so it will be more easy and it will save performance. So we have a new list called vegetables. Let's put some items into it. Go down here and find an add item to the list, either by dragging it in or searching for it up here. So I will first, I'll add potato here into list, click the X, choose the vegetables, then click save. Now let's add another item, so I'll drag it up here. 
Here I'll say onion, add it into the vegetables again, like this, I click save. Let's try to run it. Nothing will happen. This list only exists in the memory when the robot runs, but we can see it out here and we can have the list. Now we can iterate through that list. So we create it up here. We add two items to it and we want to iterate through it. So we find a for each like this and we drag it in. And here we will iterate to the vegetables list. So if I click here, I'll choose this one. We will store it into a queue and item. This queue and item refers to each one of the items in the list. So when we're iterating through it, we're saying for each item in that list. Then the first item, that will be the queue and item. When we reach the second item, we can refer to that as queue and item and so forth. I'll give it a more descriptive name. So instead of queue and item, I will say vegetable. So this, this uh, takes information of, of what's in the particular item of the list. And a list is also a list of the same variable types. Here it is text. So if I click save here, we can see that we say for each vegetable in vegetables. So this is the list. This is the queue and item. We can name this one here exactly like we want. Let's try to print out the items in our list. We'll do so by a display message and drag it in. Here I will just say vegetable displayer like this and down here I'll say your vegetable is and now we can refer to this Q and item so if I click this one here we can see it here so this will be a vegetable I'll double click it here and we use this one here so then I click save so this is all a for each does it will iterate through a collection here it's a list and then we can print out something here we can print out the values from our list let's see it in action so the first one that is potato, that was the first item we added to the list. The second, the second one is onion, fine, and this closes. Let me show you a smart way. Instead of adding these items one by one, we can do a nice little trick. So if I delete this, I delete this. Then I'll search for a set variable. That was the one we saw earlier. I drag it in here beneath the create new list. So here I will add to the vegetables, I will set the value of that variable. So when we give our list a value, we will have the percentage sign in the start and in the end. Again, the spaces doesn't serve any other purpose that makes it nicer for you and I to read. So in here, to have a list, I will say uh, these hard brackets in the start and in the end. So if I do this, so now uh, we'll add nothing to it. But if I start adding to it, that could be beats. Remember to add it in single quotation marks and remember to have it separated by commas. So here I'll say beats. Then I'll say carrots like this. And let's just pick spinach like this. And again, the single quotation marks. So we have the percentage sign outside. That will mean that we'll evaluate on this value. And then we have the hard brackets and each one of the items in single quotation marks and comma separated. Then I can click save. So now we set the variable, this list variable to these three values. So let me show you. Beets, carrots and spinach. That was all the basic stuff of variables. Well done. We will introduce more advanced variable types as this code progresses. Well done. You are on your way to learn Power Automate for desktop. Now you can build your own simple robots. The next lesson is here. You can just click it.